The Star County Political Report is pleased today to be with uh, retired judge Michael Howard, uh, Star County Family Court. And uh, Judge Howard and I go back many, many years to the late 70s where you weren't yet a judge, but uh, you were an official in the uh, Stark County Family Court. Uh, you want to start there and uh, share with uh, viewers of this uh, interview uh, your history uh, with the Family Court in sure. Stark County? Sure. I started in 1975 as an intake officer uh, and did that uh, for about a year. Intake officers work on the front end of cases, so uh, when a case is filed, um, they uh, take the case into court, make recommendations uh, to the judge. So I did that for about a year, and then I became Judge Reader's clerk and bailiff um, and um, started at law school at the same time. So I went to law school at night at Akron while I worked for Judge Reader uh, in the daytime. Uh, on leaving law school, I uh, moved to Seattle, uh, and I went to work for what was then called Touche Ross. It's now called Deloitte, which was a, a big international CPA firm. So I did tax law uh, and uh, real estate development um, out there. Uh, I still remained active uh, as a volunteer in the juvenile court uh, in Seattle as a guardian ad litem for abused and neglected kids um, in that court. So um, still had a little bit of hand in the same thing. Also served as a president for a local mental health agency. Um, so then we moved back in 1991. Uh, Judge Reeder was still on the bench. Uh, he appointed me uh, what was called referee then. It's magistrate now. Uh, so those are uh, hearing officers appointed by judges to hear cases in the family court um, and uh, subject to the, the, uh, the judge overruling or uh, modifying what uh, the referee or magistrate has done. So I did that uh, until 2004 and then when Judge Hoffman retired there was an open seat uh, on the family court bench and that's what I'd always wanted to do was be a family court judge so I ran for that uh, uh, seat and was elected in 2004, uh, re-elected again in 2010 and then retired at the end of 2016. Okay, in your time as judge, you know when I, uh, I started out uh, and knew uh, Judge Howard back in the late uh, 1970s uh, I was a legal aid attorney, and during those days, judges used to uh, float between the juvenile division and the um, uh, divorce court mm -hmm. division. Is that still the case? Yes. With? Okay. Yes. Yes. So yes. Both, you, both kinds of cases. Right? And that's a very important um, aspect of this interview to uh, focus on because uh, Judge Howard is the chairperson for a committee that uh, has uh, been put together to support uh, issue one on the August 7th special ballot uh, of this year uh, where uh, certain school districts, 14 and 17 in Stark County and a few outside of Stark County are asked to consider whether or not uh, their district uh, or, or, of course, actually, it's a majority vote of all the districts. Uh, and if a particular district doesn't vote for it, if the majority vote is yes, they're all bound uh, to participate in a 1.49 security and mental resources levy. Yes. Do I have that correct, Judge? Yeah. 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 Okay. And so we're here today to um, uh, do a number of things. Uh, first of all, uh, we want to explore the um, background of why this came to be and probably the motivating event for the Ohio General Assembly was what we all know as the uh, Parkland, Florida, Florida uh, uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School shooting February 14th of uh, 2018. Uh, unfortunately 17 students uh, and a, a, a faculty, including a faculty member or two, uh, were, uh, lost their lives in that uh, very tragic event. And so, um, uh, my information is uh, that short, within a couple of weeks after that, the Ohio General Assembly 
uh, took an existing bill and converted it into what we now know as the security and mental health resource authorization levy uh, then the uh, Stark County Educational Service Center uh, and all service centers across Ohio were authorized by the Ohio legislature uh, to um, uh, put forward uh, the uh, issues for revenue to deal with security and mental health resource issues. Do I have that correct, Judge? Well, I think Parkland was uh, definitely uh, a part of that. Uh, service centers had always been able to put on a comprehensive levy uh, uh, like this for, um, I believe it was special education purposes. Uh, so what the bill did, as I understand it, was expand that authority to include safety and, and mental health as well. Uh, and part of the motivation, too, was what was happening here in Stark County, uh, coincidental with uh, you know what happened in, on the national scene. We uh, have had, over the past year, 15 youth suicides uh, in Stark County. Um, and or teen suicides and uh, so that had occurred there was also uh, at one of the middle schools in Stark County um, one of those suicides really started as a, a plan to for a school shooting so and that, that was the incident at Jackson on February 20th yes yes so that was narrowly uh, averted and uh, I think that uh, also had uh, some of the impetus for this uh, the first quarter of 2000 uh, 18 was particularly devastating in Stark County. We had eight teen suicides in those three months. Uh, now, if you if you look at the statistics, um, the I believe it was 71 counties in in Ohio had no teen suicides. Um, 17 had. Um, well, 16 had had suicides, but none had more than two except Stark County. So Stark County had eight during that same period. So most of the counties in Stark, no suicides. A few had uh, had suicides, but all less than two or less, and Stark County had eight. So we were really um, in a crisis situation. Uh, the CDC was brought in. Uh, they've declared this to be a suicide contagion uh, and have said that it's one of the worst, if not the worst, that they have, have ever seen. So uh, that was also part of the impetus uh, for the bill. I think uh, um, uh, our uh, Senator and, and Representative uh, Olslinger and Schuring, uh, you know, were very concerned about what was, what was happening in their home district. And all four of the Stark County delegation to the Ohio General Assembly voted uh, for House Bill 24, which is the legislation that expanded the, the uh, uh, reach of the Stark County Educational Service Centers and all service centers. And those were uh, Representative Christina Hagan, uh, Scott uh, Olslager, State Senator, uh, Kirk Schering, State Representative, and uh, Thomas West, also a state uh, representative. Uh, now, uh, on April 2nd, the Stark uh, County Educational Service Center uh, called a special meeting, and that's uh, step one in the process of uh, getting uh, the 1.49 uh, tax uh, issue on the ballot for this special election. Am I right on that, Judge? I believe that was the that was Okay. The and uh, then the second part of the uh, process was April 18th, of uh, this year in which uh, by which school districts and there's 17 of them in Stark County and there's also a few districts uh, in the Stark County Educational Service Centers from Carroll uh, Summit, one in uh, uh, Summit Green, the green system, uh, Tuscarawas and Wayne and uh, but there it that's the only reach that the uh, uh, Stark County Educational Service Center has it does not include the entire counties. Uh, that's right. That's right. Right. Just certain districts. Because when we get to uh, some of the opposition uh, points, one of the rumors that's being spread is that all of uh, Carroll, Summit, Tuscarawas, and Wayne are going to be uh, uh, voting on this. 
and uh, of course uh, uh, this is a session is designed to give uh, Judge Howard, the head of the committee, the opportunity to clear things up of what is fact and what is fiction. Right. It won't be. It, it will only be people living in those school districts that are that are part of this, not the entire population of Summit uh, or Carroll County. Right. And um, then on August 25th, the uh, Stark County Educational Service Center uh, voted to. Um, no, August 25th. Pardon? You said August 25th. Did I? Oh, thanks for the correction. April 25th. Right. Uh, and um, uh, voted uh, to uh, go ahead and uh, ask the uh, Board of Elections to uh, put the issue on the ballot uh, for August 7th of this year. And by the way, uh, I need to do a disclaimer. I don't think I've done it so far that my wife, uh, Mary Olson, is a uh, member of the Stark County Educational Service Center. Now, uh, moving um, on in the uh, discussion here, uh, the, the board itself uh, had a little bit of a uh, difference internally. Uh, there, it was a three to one vote in favor of putting the initiative on the ballot on April 25th. Uh, my wife, uh, voted uh, with the majority and uh, board member uh, Fran uh, Miller uh, voted in the negative and her uh, point of opposition as I understand it was the continuing nature of the um, uh, ballot initiative. And so we'll start right there with Judge uh, Howard in responding uh, to uh, points that uh, members of the voting public have made and uh, with the, uh, the continuing uh, nature of the issue. Why continuing? Well, Martin, this is not a problem that, that's going to go away. And um, uh, in my years on the bench, uh, you know, 30 years uh, at Stark County Family Court, 25 of which were on the bench, uh, I've seen the mental health issue with youth uh, get uh, worse and worse. Um, and it's reached this crisis point with this suicide contagion. Um, and certainly uh, the school shooting, the school safety issue has become much more acute. Uh, there have been many more of those than there were uh, back in the 90s. So there's been a continual uh, increase in concern over, over both of those issues. Um, it's a, it's a little bit like uh, you know what happened in this country after 9/11 and the security at the uh, at the airport. Uh, I mean that is something that I think we all agree is is continuous, has been continuous, and will continue uh, to be continuous. We simply have to protect uh, ourselves when we travel by air, uh, and the same thing is true of our kids. We have to provide our kids with safety and security in the classroom because security and safety come first. If they do not feel secure and safe, they cannot do their schoolwork, they cannot learn. Uh, if they're constantly in a state of high uh, arousal looking for threats and, and danger uh, around every corner, they're not going to be able to focus on their studies. So, um, you know, this has an academic component to it as well as a, uh, as a safety component. So that is, is the, the reason that I think it needs to be continuous. Um, I became involved in a lot of prevention activities uh, in Stark County uh, over the years. I, I came to believe that uh, the best cure for juvenile delinquency was to prevent it from occurring rather than to try to intervene later. So uh, I, I've gotten involved um, uh, here at United Way uh, where we, we happen to be doing this interview. Um, uh, so I'm on the board here and uh, I'm also on the board of the Stark Education Partnership uh, which is trying to enhance school uh, performance of, of, of kids uh, across the county. Uh, I'm uh, the board chair of the Early Childhood Resource Center because I believe that we have to go as far Far back upstream as possible. Ideally, we would start uh, at minus nine months at the beginning of pregnancy. Make sure all moms had good prenatal care uh, and uh, good good care uh, through those uh, first few years when the brain uh, is undergoing 90% of its development. Uh, that helps get them ready for school, and if they're successful in school, they tend not to come to court. I saw 
very few students in all those years at Family Court, or very very few juveniles, who were good students. Almost every kid that appeared in front of me was struggling in school. So if we can make them successful in school, hopefully we can reduce um, the, the delinquency and the criminal activity. So th that's been a belief of mine forever. So it was, it was natural for me to become involved uh, in this levy because I think uh, it's about prevention. Um, one of the programs that, that the uh, Early Childhood Resource Center runs is SPARK, which is for three and four year olds, uh, where the, they have home visitation, they get the parents involved in teaching literacy and numeracy, uh, and uh, that has been a very successful program. Uh, so if we, if we analogize this to that, we wouldn't do SPARK for five years and then decide not to do SPARK anymore. And we wouldn't consider that we were done with our work if we only did five years uh, worth of that kind of a program. So that's the sort of thing. The programs that this can provide, this levy can provide, in the school districts are similar to SPARK. We're going to hopefully teach kids to be more resilient uh, so that they can withstand the bad things that happen to them. Uh, and we're going to try to address their mental health problems, and there will always be those kinds of problems. So. Um, this is not something either from a safety standpoint or from a security standpoint that is going to go away. Um, now I do understand the concern that people have about um, uh, wanting to have some control and some accountability. But I would submit that a school board is probably one of the most uh, responsive governmental agencies um, that there is. And, and Martin, you cover a lot of, of governmental agencies, uh, and you know how, it can, how difficult it can be uh, as a citizen to, uh, to, to get that accountability. Uh, that's one of the things that, that uh, you know, it's what you're all about. Um, but. People can go to a school board meeting, they can ask uh, the school board members, you know, what are you spending this money on? They can inquire of the superintendent, they can have an individual meeting with the superintendent. They can uh, make a public records request uh, to ask, you know, where this money is being spent. There's also the um, uh, advantage that this money will, uh, that these funds will be audited by the state auditor. They can only be used for safety and security. Uh, so uh, if there's an auditor's finding that they have not been uh, used for that, there will be consequences to that. So there are a number of safeguards and a number of ways that people can be held accountable. Uh, if a citizen in one of the districts doesn't feel the money's being properly spent, um, they can uh, support another candidate for school board or they can run for school board themselves uh, and uh, that those are not uh, that that's not a monumental task uh, to to be active in local government that way and demand that accountability okay backing up just a bit how did you come to be involved in the formation of the committee and heading up the committee and who are some of the folks that are on this committee well uh, uh, the the treasurer is um, uh, Chris Goff uh, who is on the Jackson board um, uh, uh, Joe Chaddock has uh, has advised the committee uh, and we have a number of um, uh, Michael, Mike Galena from Altman Hospital is also on the committee. Maria Higgy here from uh, uh, United Way is on the committee. Teresa Persis from the Stark Education Partnership um, is um, on the committee. Um, and I, I became involved because um, uh, Joe Chaddock asked me if I would if I would chair the committee uh, because. And he, what time frame wise? What, when do you remember that being? Uh, probably back when the board was voting. So I guess April seems I, I, it's that seems like a long time ago, but I guess it hasn't been that long. Um, but uh, Joe knows how passionate I am. I sit I sit on the the care team executive committee. Uh, that oversees all of our care teams in the schools, and he knows how passionate I am about uh, having school success be a delinquency prevention tool. Um, so because I've, I've been so involved in, in working with the schools and trying to enhance that relationship uh, with family court when I was on the bench um, and continuing, um, he asked me if I if I'd be willing to do this. As I said, it was it's right up uh, my alley. I mean, it's exactly philosophically what I believe that we need to be doing for kids. Okay, uh, continuing on with points that uh, citizens and others are making uh, uh, in terms of questions about the uh, 
issue. Uh, one, you know, of course, Perry is not participating. Canton City Schools is not participating. And um, Canton local schools are not uh, participating. And uh, one of the reasons I'm told, I'm not re real sure that uh, this is accurate, uh, uh, but I understand Perry uh, either has or is got its own levy and was concerned about overload, levy overload. Yes. And I so think, I think that's correct. You okay? And um, uh, so your uh, response uh, to that? Um, I think again, this is this is a little bit goes back to local control. Uh, each school board made a decision whether they were going to be uh, involved or not, uh, and the considerations of each individual district came into play. Uh, Perry has a wellness center, um, a levy that's either on or has been on uh, for that wellness center. Uh, they did not want this to interfere with that, so. Uh, they are going to fund this in a different way. Uh, Can City, I think, uh, because they're a big urban district, um, they have some grant funds and s some sources of funds that other districts, suburban districts, may not have. Uh, they have always been very progressive about uh, addressing these mental health issues and have worked very closely uh, with the court and uh, with other agencies in the county uh, on the care teams and on trauma and resiliency training in the school. Um, so they felt that they could go it alone and, um, and decided that that's what they wanted to do. I believe Green is going to have their uh, their own levy uh, to do it, and there's been some talk that Carrollton may do that as well. And that that's fine, um, but uh, had we left this, I think, for each individual district to do this themselves, uh, would they things would not have come online uh, at the same time. I think we're going to get an advantage um, when this passes in August, I think we're going to have the advantage of all the districts having money coming at the same time so that they can make joint purchasing. For example, uh, there's going to be some software enhancements. Uh, one of the things that the Sheriff's uh, Safety and Security uh, uh, team has recommended is that um, we use the uh, system like the Alertus system, which is uh, in place at Ohio State uh, and provides real-time warning. So if there is a lockdown, uh, there'll be a text that'll come to student phones and parents will be notified. Um, and that can, can save lives. When there was an incident at Ohio State with a, a, a stabbing, those students got uh, warning of that on that alert, alerted system uh, and were told where to shelter and, and how not to uh, accidentally come upon the scene of where that occurred. So um, we can uh, do some joint purchasing and uh, have some economies of scale uh, to bring some of these things online all at the same time. Uh, school resource officers, uh, if, if all the districts are hiring school resource officers at the same time, a school resource officer would be a police officer or um, um, uh, someone like that, a sheriff's deputy uh, in the school. Uh, we can do the training uh, all at the same time. So there would be, there are some economies of scale at bringing these things online. And I think that's something that people have asked for in Stark County. There have been a lot of uh, attempts to break down silos and uh, and have you know more efficient government uh, and combine some of these state and county departments and things like that. That's been talked about for a long time. So here's an example of these districts all coming together of the same mind and saying, let's break down the silos and the barriers. Let's do something collectively uh, to protect our kids. So there's as an overall approach to the extent that it's practical. Yes. Uh, but there is, for instance, I, on July 19th, uh, was at playing a meeting uh, that um, playing Superintendent Brent May and Bo uh, Board President John Halkius, who, by the way, is uh, president-elect of the Ohio State uh, uh, School Board Association, and uh, uh, they uh, detailed very precisely what the plain program and, and of course there is a Stark County Political Report blog up mm -hmm. where I list point by point their uh, individual application and I uh, assume that there's going to be that factor in every school district 
that is participating should the issue pass. Yes, yes. And um, uh, so uh, uh, to the degree that we can consolidate and be more efficient uh, in Stark County, uh, the uh, your uh, effort uh, with this committee is uh, committed to that sort of thing. Oh yes, absolutely, okay. absolutely. Uh, now, one of the uh, points made uh, for by one of the uh, uh, not, not participating districts, I think it was Canton Local, is at least uh, not necessarily someone from the school community, but a, um, a person that I deem to be in touch with what's happening in uh, Canton Local, which is Canton South in terms of the high school, is um, that uh, they don't want to be a donor district. Mm -hmm. And of course a donor district would be one that doesn't get a return on the tax dollar on the positive side, it's on the negative side. And of course an extreme example of that in the overall scheme of things is Jackson. Mm -hmm. Jackson only gets 68 cents on the dollar by a computation that I obtained uh, through the Stark County Auditor. And uh, how do you respond uh, to uh, that criticism? Well, I think, you know, Jackson is in a, a very unique uh, position because uh, a lot of their, their valuation, their gross valuation in Jackson is commercial property. Um, I think 60% maybe is a, is a number that I've heard. Uh, and that commercial property, Belton Village and the Strip um, and, and the businesses there, those businesses are, uh, the patrons of those businesses come from all over the county. So the advantage that Jackson has of having a higher valuation, we're in the county are all supporting that. So. Um, uh, you know, I think that makes it a little more palatable that they have have an outflow uh, because we are all helping to support their business valuation and now in reciprocal they're helping to support some of these things for schools. Um, I, I, I get a little bit concerned that, that uh, I guess that, that people are focusing on that issue because uh, those boundaries of those districts are very artificial and the kids don't really um, the way the kids interact don't really recognize those boundaries. In other words, uh, kids in Canton South are interacting uh, with kids in Carrollton, they're interacting uh, with kids in Brown Local, uh, they're interacting with kids in Canton City, um, and so, so the kids are, they're communicating I think even more, interacting more because of social media. Um, and, and, and in Stark County, there is such a thing as a collaboration. Oh yes. Were the uh, you know, for instance, one of my daughters mm -hmm. many years ago mm -hmm. now uh, went to North Canton. We're, right. we're, we live in Lake, and as part of the collaboration, uh, so this is um, a um, an example of the interaction that you're speaking yeah. to, mm -hmm. and so your your child could be in a number of different districts uh, in Stark County. Yeah, and, and certainly these these tragedies that we've had, these suicides, have affected kids. I, you know, I remember, uh, you know, when one of the incidents happened in the western uh, part of the county, the kids at Marlington uh, and Alliance, uh, you know, did, uh, you know, some projects and sent some cards and letters and things uh, to tell them that they were uh, thinking about them and, and supporting them, so so those boundaries, to a certain extent, they're they're a little bit artificial. I mean, these are all our kids. Um, you know, one example that somebody gave that sort of resonated with me was if we had a, a, an outbreak or a contagion of Ebola in one of our districts, uh, you know, we wouldn't we wouldn't stick to those boundaries. We would all want that to be treated uh, because of the contagious, uh, and, and again, they call this suicide thing a contagion. Uh, you know, we don't want that spreading. I mean, it's important that we, you know, that we all come together and address the problem. And of course, in this day and age of social media, uh, uh, students probably communicate with one another across the various 
of uh, platforms. Right. So, and uh, so that's kind of a, another factor of uh, the interaction that takes place among uh, students uh, in the area. Um, another uh, point that's uh, raised, and uh, I don't know if you know this gentleman or not, Dan Fonte, who used to be a head of the um, a business manager for Local 94, the pipe fitters and plumbers, uh, wrote me an email, which I published on my blog, and his uh, big complaint was that the public didn't have an adequate opportunity to have input into the formulation of the 1.49 mil levy. Uh, well, I'm not. I'm not sure what what you mean by formulation. Well, th just um, how that came about. What was the process uh, where that number was arrived at, and uh, was uh, uh, were uh, uh, were uh, was there any kind of survey done of the um, uh, constituents? of the various school districts, um, uh, that sort of thing. I don't know that, uh, that there was anything done like that, but I, I guess I would, I would say that there was public input from the standpoint that each individual school board had to vote uh, to approve this. So, so those are school board members are members of the public, and they're elected to represent the public. Um, and uh, you know, they this would not have happened without the approval uh, of those various of those various school boards. Uh, I would also, uh, you know, go back to what we talked about earlier. I think the urgency of this that when when this was passed, we had had uh, during that quarter eight suicides, and one of which was an attempted school shooting. So I, I think there was some, um, uh, you know, a sense of urgency that we need to do something to step up and address this problem and do something to help the kids. Um, that that and that urgency, I think, uh, you know, may have made the process faster than some people are comfortable with. Um, one, and this is kind of an interesting observation that, and this uh, came from Canton City School District, is one of the reasons that a person in the mix in Canton City Schools, who I think is uh, a uh, significant figure in, in uh, their scheme of things, is they talked about taxation without representation. Uh, it appears to me from just looking at the Stark County Educational Service Center website that the city districts in Stark County and across, across their jurisdiction are members of the SCESC, but their citizens cannot vote or nor can their citizens run for a position on the Stark County Educational Service Center. So that comes out from their perspective, for some of them, of taxation without representation. Uh, how do you react to something well, I, like I, that? I, I, I don't know whether I would describe it as taxation without representation. You are correct, though, uh, and I, I don't know why the the law is that way. But only local school district can vote for ESC board members, uh, and that seems very archaic because the ESC serves, uh, you know, certainly the city districts as well, um, and districts can opt to be served by various different service centers. Um, but uh, yeah, it's a uh, that is sort of an anachronistic, uh, you know, feature to this. Um, but what you have to remember is the money is a direct pass through. So um, the the service center is not keeping any of this money. They're taking no fee. Um, and they will use none of this money. Every dollar that is raised will be passed out to the to the districts. Uh, and the proposal is two hundred twenty five dollars per student in the district. Um, uh, and the number of students in the districts would be calculated based on something, some average daily attendance uh, figure that the state does. So that is how that's going to to be passed out. So um, it's not a situation where the service center can withhold the money or say we're not going to give money to your district or we're going to channel all the money to another district. Uh, you know, this is set up so it would be again a direct pass through. Uh, with nothing remaining uh, at the service center. Okay. 
Um, now the expense of the uh, special election. Last number I had was uh, uh, three hundred thousand four hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. uh, how, how do you justify that? Well, again, I think the the urgency and the uh, the concern that we did not want to put this on uh, at a time when th there were other potential school issues on. Uh, it's difficult enough to get a school levy or a school bond issue passed uh, without having competing levies or bond issues. So um, I think uh, we did not want to do anything that was going to interfere with a, a local issue uh, from any of the of the districts that might be on the ballot in um, in November or even next May. Uh, so that was part of it. The other part of it was that had we waited to put this on the ballot until November, we would not, as, as I understand it, we would not have been able to collect funds until the beginning of 2019. Because it's on the ballot in August, we should be begin to receive funds sometime in January or February of next year uh, and again that enables us to take action faster uh, to to help the kids so it was a it was a decision um, to, to to do that for those two reasons to get the money faster and not to in, interfere with uh, other elections um, uh, the final point that I want to make in terms of those that um, seem to be uh, tending toward not supporting the issue is uh, the uh, reality, electoral reality, that let's, and we'll take my example. Uh, Mary and I live in the Lake School District, and Lake is uh, part of the uh, 14 or 17 Stark County districts that are uh, participating. And it could be that Lake will vote no uh, yeah. as a, a political entity, uh, but uh, a majority of the district, including the few in uh, Carroll, uh, Wayne, Tuscarawas, and, and uh, uh, some, of course, two of, two of those are not participating. Um, if the majority of the participating district, uh, Stark County Educational Service Center district-wide, vote affirmatively then even if Lake votes no, then Lake's part of it. Yes. Yes. And what was the what's the uh, thinking behind that? Do you have to know? Well, I I think it's just again the district and and um, that thinking goes back again to these boundaries and and the artificial nature of the school district boundaries that we talked about um, before um, that. You know, we have a problem in Stark County with with teen suicide. We have a, an issue in Stark County with school safety, uh, and it, it cuts across you know all the different districts. So, um, um, you know, I I just don't feel that those boundaries should stand in the way of, of helping uh, the kids that that need the help. And uh, the uh, campaign effort, is that mostly uh, the work of your committee? You know, at our house, we've gotten one flyer so far. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. There are going to be additional flyers? Yeah, there will be some uh, some mailings, targeted mailing, um, and uh, social media. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, anybody out? Uh, I know that Brent May and John Halke is uh, is out there? Is there anybody else uh, out there? Uh? Uh, Joe Chaddock is, has spoken to a number of groups. Uh, I think some of the other superintendents as well. Um, I think there was a meeting uh, down in the southeastern part of the county last night that uh, that Joe spoke uh, spoke to. Down in the Minerva area. Yeah, uh, and Joe, of course, is from that right. area. Right. 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 Uh, any getting any kind of feedback? Um, you know, hard to tell. I've heard some of the same concerns uh, that you have, and uh, um, but you know, I've had lots of positives as well. And uh, you know, I just am, am really hoping that that the citizens of Stark County will come together and do this. This is this is really really important for our kids. Um, you know, I I've been on uh, the coordinating committee, there's a, the school, there's a safety and security committee, the sheriff chairs, and there's a coordinating committee that's made up of, uh, um, you know, Joe Chaddock and uh, some people from the ESC um, and uh, the Star County Health Department, uh, the CDC people when, when they were here, um, the uh, 
uh, Ohio Department of Health. Um, Liz Edmonds from Altman Hospital uh, is on the committee. Uh, Dr. Andrew Mader, who's a pediatrician who works uh, the, as the head of our Help Me Grow program, she uh, has also been there as well. And we've been meeting regularly. Uh, and some of the um, some of the things that have come up are just absolutely heartbreaking. We had. Um, um, uh, a period of time at the end of May, we, we hadn't had a completed suicide for a number of, uh, of weeks, um, and we were all sort of holding our breath, but in one week in May, there were two uh, overdoses and one attempted hanging, uh, and they were all middle school kids. Um, and then shortly after that, about two weeks later, uh, we had another um, a suicide of a, a middle school kid here in Stark County uh, and a suicide elsewhere in the state, but the child had lived here in Stark County uh, and attended Central Catholic uh, and then uh, moved away. So all the Central kids, uh, he was participant in sports and all the Central kids knew him, so uh, that affected them uh, as well. So every time this happens, uh, uh, the uh, the shock waves that go out affect you know dozens of other kids. Um, I've talked to some people that I grew up with and said you know did we lose anybody in high school uh, you know and uh, you know most people can remember maybe once in four years having you know someone die in a traffic accident or or something like that. Um, Altogether this year, 25 kids have died, the 15 suicides, and then 10 accidental deaths. Um, and that is just, uh, I, I can't imagine what, what that's like. I lost a very good friend, uh, you know, when I was college age, and, uh, uh, you know, it was the first peer that I, I can remember, you know, passing away. And, uh, you know, it affected the entire rest of my life. Um, so, so this is not something that, uh, is trivial to these to these kids, and um, I think that you know some of the hopelessness that we're seeing that is causing this uh, is the same kind of hopelessness that has caused our opioid epidemic. And uh, you know we we have to do some things to address mental health issues and um, and build resiliency uh, in kids. Uh, it's just. It's so difficult to, to, to think about a young person that age deciding that the only answer is to take their own life. I, it, it, it's, just in, it's just incomprehensible to me that they have shut off the potential um, that they have um, and the joy that they would experience through the rest of their life um, is so early in life. It's, it's incomprehensible. So you would agree with uh, Brett May, superintendent of the Plain Local Schools, and uh, board president uh, John Halkius, that this is primarily a mental health issue, and yes, there's a security component, but it's really dealing with the uh, deep um, psychological uh, factors that our student bodies are experiencing. Yeah, yeah. I think uh, you know what. What is, again? What is happening with social media is is unprecedented. Um, a young person um, communicated to us about it. Somebody said, uh, you know, is there a lot of bullying or what? You know, what's what does what's the effect of the social media? And she said, well, it's not only that. It's also she said, my phone. Uh, you know, all day long, I'm getting messages about terrible things happening all over. Uh, you know, the world that I can't do anything about. It just just breeds, you know, hopelessness, um, and you know, it's 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 easy to say, well, she should shut her phone off, but that's very difficult in this in this day and age. It's very difficult for adults, let alone uh, kids. I mean, we are, um, I'll use the word addicted. We're addicted to those uh, to that uh, to that media. So, um, you know, I think that um, is part of it. But we do, you know, there are evidence-based uh, treatments out there for trauma, and, and we've done some things in the school to, to begin training teachers on how to recognize uh, kids that have been through traumatic experiences, experiences that have threatened their life, safety, or well-being. Um, you know, when that happens to a kid, um, and it could happen because of, of, you know, community violence, it can happen because of domestic violence in the home. Um, it can happen because of, uh, you know, natural disasters or, you know, traffic accidents or medical emergencies. 
Um, the research says that about two-thirds of kids by the time they're 16 have experienced at least one potentially traumatic event. Um, but and that affects the way they react to things. It affects the, their ability to learn in the classroom. Uh, learning to recognize that and learning techniques uh, you know, to help them get past that um, is critical. We're doing some training with teachers in Stark County. This was even before, uh, uh, you know, this this past year with the contagion. Uh, we had already started uh, that kind of work. Our care teams are out there. We have a good infrastructure in the schools in Stark County uh, to take advantage of these additional funds that uh, the, uh, the levy would provide. We can really ramp up and take to scale some of these things that uh, you know we know we need to be doing and we've been resource constrained, haven't been able to do it because we didn't have the funds uh, you know, to hire personnel or, or do training or in-service days. Um, so uh, you know, good evidence-based programs that I think can help turn this around uh, can be brought to scale if we, if we get this money. Well, I've tried to cover every aspect of issue one, uh, but I always, at uh, the end of every Stark County Political Report interview, offer the uh, person I'm interviewing an opportunity to say, oh, Martin, you missed such and such. So um, in the interest of uh, giving uh, you, Judge Howard, uh, a full and unfettered opportunity to um, make any uh, point that you uh, want to, uh, please, uh, anything else that you want to share uh, with the uh, Stark County School Districts that are participating, and they're not only Stark County, but uh, Carroll and, uh, and the other counties that are involved that you want uh, to share with uh, them? Well, I, uh, you know, Martin, I, I got involved in, you know, as I said at the beginning, I, I was sort of in juvenile justice and then I was out of it and I came back to it. Um, and it was really like coming home. Um, you know, I find that I have a real empathy for kids. Um, and 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 what they're going through and um, you know I just I, I can't help that so I, I was drawn to the work at family court and and since retirement I've you know I've continued to volunteer um, you know primarily with with issues related um, to kids and families and you know trying to help kids become successful um, you know I am heartbroken over what has happened in this in, in our county um, I am heartbroken that kids, you know, again, see no way out other than taking their own life. Um, so, you know, I want to help, and it, it just it, it it's it's hard for me to understand that somebody would not want to join in that in that effort. Um, you know, I understand that you know economically, people, uh, you know, things are tough out there. Uh, but, you know, we have always come together to take care of our kids. That's what civilized society does. We take care of our kids. Um, you know, we're judged on how we treat the weakest and the most vulnerable, and that are, that's our kids. So, uh, you know, I'm just praying that, that, you know, on August 7th, people will realize that and they will come together and say, you know, I can, I can part with a little bit of money to make kids safer and make kids successful. And some focus uh, needs to be uh, paid uh, to the fact that the actual money that it would cost a property owner and uh, a school district is really very minimal. Well, I, you know, I I hate to use the word minimal because I, you know I've gone door to door for levies before and I've had you know people on fixed incomes tell me that they just they can't do it. You know they you know that it's it, it's not possible. I know there are people out there that you know that that have that concern. And you have empathy for that. And I and I do, but I think um, you know when we're talking about with the with the hundred thousand dollar fair market value. Uh, you know, about $52 a year, you know, that's a dollar a week. Um, you know, geez, a lot of us, you know, go to Starbucks, you know, three or four times a week and spend, you know, way more than that, uh, you know, on a drink and, you know, maybe just forego a, a little bit of that so that a kid can grow up and, and have a happy, successful life. Okay, well, thank you, Judge Michael Howard, a retired judge from the Stark County Family Court and the head of the committee uh, that is uh, advocating 
uh, for the passage of issue one, uh, sec school security and mental health resource levy on August 7th, 2018. Thank you, Martin.